In this lesson, we'll cover three common hand injuries, Boxer's fracture, scaphoid fracture, and de Corvain's tenosynovitis. Let's start with the boxer fracture. I see this type of fracture commonly in people who get frustrated and punch a wall. This traumatic blow to the fourth or fifth knuckle results in a metacarpal neck fracture. Boxer's fractures are pretty common and account for 20% of all hand fractures. On exam, there will be a lot of swelling and tenderness on the dorsal and ulnar side of the hand, just proximal to the fourth or fifth MCP joints. The problem with this kind of fracture is that it can be unstable and may have some degree of angulation or even rotation. For example, on this x-ray, you can see that the fracture of the fifth metacarpal is angulated. So even after reduction, poor alignment is common, leading to chronic pain and compromised function. My approach to this kind of injury is to try my best to reduce the angulation and put them in an ulnar gutter splint. I always have these patients follow up with a hand specialist within a couple of days. Next, let's look at the scaphoid fracture. You'll recall that in the hand anatomy lesson, I highlighted the scaphoid bone and promised to talk about scaphoid fractures in more detail. Remember that this is the most fractured carpal bone, and due to its unique blood flow, it is at particular risk for necrosis if missed. This injury typically occurs when your patient falls on an outstretched hand. We typically refer to this mechanism with the abbreviation FOUCHE. On exam, there is maximum tenderness over the anatomical snuffbox. Routine anterior-posterior, or AP, and lateral radiographs of the hand may demonstrate the fracture. In this example, the fracture is subtle on the AP view and not visible on the lateral view. But a dedicated scaphoid view with the hand ulnar deviated is better. Look how you can see the fracture more clearly on the dedicated view. Unfortunately, despite this additional view, up to 30% of acute scaphoid fractures may be missed. If available, a limited MRI of the carpal bones will be nearly 100% sensitive for making the diagnosis. Of course, MRI is not easily available in many locations, so the best course of action when this injury is suspected is to place the patient in a thumb spike a splint and have them repeat an x-ray in 7 to 10 days. If a fracture is seen on this repeat x-ray, the patient will need to follow up with a hand surgeon and likely have a cast for five more weeks. On the other hand, if the initial x-ray shows a displaced fracture, especially if it's in the proximal scaphoid like this one, the best course of action is to place the patient in a thumb spicosplant and consult a surgeon on the same day. This is because displaced fractures have a high rate of non-union of 50% compared to 15% in non-displaced and often require operative management. Now let's move on to de Corvain's tenosynovitis. This is a common disorder named for the Swiss surgeon Fritz de Corvain, who first described it in 1895. It affects the two tendons that control the movement of the thumb, the extensor pollicis brevis and the adductor pollicis longus, causing pain over the radial aspect of the wrist with radiation to the forearm. The exact cause is not clear. We used to think that it was related to repetitive work, but now most authorities believe that while this exacerbates the pain, it's not the primary cause. Interestingly, the syndrome is more common in women and happens more frequently during pregnancy. On exam, you'll elicit pain with palpation just distal to the radial styloid process, and you may even feel crepitation and enlargement of this area. The maneuver used to make this clinical diagnosis is called the Finkelstein test. The patient tucks their thumb in their hand and then ulnar deviates the wrist. Severe pain while doing this maneuver is a positive result. As you may have guessed, the treatment is immobilization with a thumb spica splint for about two weeks with a short course of NSAIDs. For recurrent or refractory cases, you can refer to a specialist to inject steroids into the tendon sheath. Now, you'll be able to handle the diagnosis and initial treatment of some of the most common hand injuries. In the next MedMastery lesson, we'll cover common forearm and elbow injuries. So I hope you liked this video. 
absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.